when we look at this image, we see a pretty picture of a beautiful still life. And what we see in this picture has phenomenal accuracy and photographic realism hundreds of years before the camera was even invented. But this painting is so much more than that. So in order to understand what's going on in this canvas, we need to take a look at what was going on off the canvas. To do so, we're going to go back to the 17th century. And we're going to go back to the 17th century and the early half of that, what was known as the Dutch Golden Age. And to do so, we're going to go back to a place that was called the United Kingdom of the Low Countries. As you can see in this next slide, the United Kingdom of the Low Countries was Flanders, Wallonia, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands. But today it's Belgium, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands. And in fact, the name the Low Countries is a bit of a misnomer because in truth, the place was called Los Países Bajos. This is Castilian Spanish that literally translates to the Low Countries. The reason it was called Los Países Bajos is because Spain actually controlled this region. And this created profound resentment amongst the Dutch of the Netherlands for many reasons. One is the Dutch and the Northern Netherlands, they saw themselves as being culturally different than Spanish. First, they had a profoundly different linguistic heritage. So too the distance between the two places. So if you take in mind the idea in the 1600s of traveling from Spain to Holland, it would take days if not weeks to go from one place to the other, not to mention the Pyrenees Mountains in between. But most importantly perhaps is the idea that Spain was Catholic controlled and the Netherlands was Protestant. And this is deep within the heart of the Protestant Reformation. All of this in the mentioned would boil over into what would become to call the 80-year war. This 80-year war, as you can see in the next slide, was predominantly a war that took place as naval battles at sea. Now, in this picture here, we see a painting. It's a Dutch painting by a Dutch artist. And on the left here, where you can see it where I'm kind of circling here, this is the Dutch flag on a smaller Dutch ship, and they are fighting the Spanish Navy. At this point in time in the world, Spain is the world's superpower. They control large swaths of land throughout Europe, the Americas, and even on the other side of the world in the Philippines. Not to mention, of course, the Low Countries themselves. Well, no one would have thought that a small little region like the Netherlands would be able to defeat Spain, the most powerful military and country in the world at the time. But this, the, as you can see, these small ships here have cannons on them by the Dutch. What the Dutch had been doing is they were building small, nimble ships that could get into and out of ports all over the world. Because at the time, the Dutch had become renowned merchant traders. They were trading with countries that we know today as being Turkey, Iran, India, Indonesia, and even Japan. When they would trade goods with these countries, they would bring the goods back to Holland and it would enrich the ship's owners. But before they could do any of this, they had to take control of the shipping routes around the world. The shipping routes, by the way, at this point in time, were considered state secrets, similar to those that might be controlled by the Central Intelligence Agency, because the shipping routes controlled the currents that took ships to different parts of the world, which would bring goods back to Europe. So here what we see is actually a merchant ship that the Dutch eventually armed with cannons, and over that course of that 80-year war would eventually defeat the Spanish and take control of the shipping routes. In this next slide, what we see is something that almost seems a little bit uh, bucolic in comparison. There's no war going on here, but we have all these small little ships around the bigger ones. Now keep in mind when you look at this picture, the large ships are the size of an American football field to this day. And these large ships, these are no ordinary ships. These ships are the actual property rights of two corporations the Dutch started in the 1600s that changed the world and still influence us to this day. These companies were called the East and West Dutch Indies Trading Corporations. And these corporations would go east and west in the respective directions of their names to trade with different parts of the world, bring these goods back to Holland, and enrich the ship's owners. They would do so, and it would enrich not only the ship's owners, but so too potentially the crew. But there was a great problem within all of this, is if the ship was built and went to the other side of the world and never came back, the ship's owner would become profoundly broke instead of profoundly rich. So what the Dutch did to solve this problem is they began selling certificates. These certificates had profound importance on the world we live in to this day. 
but we'll get to that in just a moment. In the next slide here, what we see is an auction house. This is a Dutch painting in the 1600s of an auction house, and in the middle of the table, I'm kind of circling here, are tulips. These are tulips that were brought back from present-day Persia or Iran. The tulips are being auctioned off, and here in the foreground we see a man with a quill and a book. He's recording the prices of these tulips, and in the background we see all sorts of commotion of people. Well, what this painting is showing us is in the auction house, anyone could bid on these goods and then later resell them. So for the first time in the history of Europe, you didn't need to be of the royal class to become rich, or as the Dutch called it, the burger class. You could be just about anyone, buy a good that you thought might be worth value, and then sell it later. And that's precisely what's happening here. So as we take into account the idea of the auction houses, let's step back to the idea of the ships and selling the certificates. Because here in the auction house, they're selling the goods that were acquired on other parts of the world for phenomenal sums of money. But as we go forward, we see another photorealistic painting of a plaza. This is done by a Dutch artist in the 1600s. This, however, is no ordinary plaza. It's phenomenal, right? This plaza, what makes it so phenomenal is that these certificates we talked about were being bought, sold, and traded here. So let's give an example to the certificate. Let's say Johan, he buys a certificate from one of the ship owners, and he does so for X amount of dollars. When he does so, the ship's owner says to him, when this ship returns to port, you'll get 10% of the gross total profits of the ship. So they take the certificate to City Hall in Amsterdam and they get it notarized and it becomes certified. But these ships, keep in mind, would be gone for months at time, if not years. And as we all know right now, over the course of months, if not years, life takes place. And let's say what happens with Johan is he has a certificate that he traded all of his hard-earned money for and he decides, hey, this is just a fancy piece of paper and that ship may never come back. So he goes to the plaza that we're actually looking at in this very painting and he decides to trade the certificate for a horse so that he can use more horsepower in his fields to make more profit off of his, gar his garden and his, his agricultural business. Or perhaps he trades it for a bushel of wheat to feed his family or better still, Perhaps he trades a certificate for more money than he bought it for initially and makes a profit. Then the guy who bought it from him turns around and sells it to someone else and so on and so on. This plaza and this painting that we are looking at is no ordinary plaza because this plaza is the basis of the world's first stock exchange. The Dutch in the 1600s created the world's first stock exchange and they so too created what was called the world's first future commodities exchange. Both of those ideas, of course, still exist to this day. So the future exchange and how it relates to the paintings we're going to talk about is this. Johan takes the money he made off the certificate and he thinks to himself, I bet the wheat harvest next year is going to be worth a lot of money. So he buys the rights at City Hall to the wheat harvest in the following year, but he does so at today's price. If the wheat harvest happens to be very good, he will then next year make a lot of money off of it. But if for some reason it rains too much or too little and the wheat harvest is very poor, he'll lose a ton of money. This basic idea forms the foundation of not only stock exchanges today, but future exchanges that exist in commodity markets from Chicago and New York City to Hong Kong and Shanghai, all started by the Dutch. Why this is so incredibly important to what we're talking about is up until this point in Europe, all money had been controlled by monarchies. And then the Dutch set apart this system, which created the foundation of today's modern capitalism. Money flowed throughout Europe into Holland, enriching them beyond their wildest dreams. So in the final slide, before we get back to the painting we started with, we see a hand-drawn picture of a map. This is an island off the coast of a continental shelf. And if we look close, I'll circle it with my arrow on the screen. What we see is a wall that was built around this south tip of this island here. And on the very southern tip of the island I'm circling is a star-shaped fort. This was built by the Dutch, and in the middle of it is a canal that so too was built by the Dutch. What we're looking at is a hand-drawn map from the 1600s of a city called New Amsterdam. New Amsterdam was incredibly important to what we're going to talk about with the paintings because just to the left here where my arrow is, is a river. This arrow to the left of the picture plane is a river that allowed the Dutch to send their ships into the continental shelf and trade with indigenous tribes for furs and pelts that they would then take back to Europe and sell for phenomenal amounts of money. 
When they did so, they attracted the attention of other would-be and wannabe world superpowers. In this case, they attracted the attention of the English. The English came and tried to seize this part of the island. They eventually paid the indigenous tribes that had been trading with the Dutch to help them seize the island, and eventually the English overcame the walls that are around the edge of this city of New Amsterdam. When they overcame the walls of the city, they tore down the fort. After they tore down the fort, what they did is they renamed the city, so it no longer paid homage to Holland, being called New Amsterdam. They changed the name from New Amsterdam to pay homage to the name of the general who had helped the English seize this island. His surname was York, so they renamed the island New York City. The picture that we are looking at is the birth of New York City that was actually colonized initially by the Dutch. Now, if we look closely, there's a rather banal looking street that has a secondary wall on it. This is incredibly important because after the English seized this city, they tore down that wall and they built a street on top of it. When they did so, they made that street the most famous street in the history of the world, then all the way up until today. That street is very aptly named to this day, Wall Street. So Wall Street literally was a wall that was supposed to be unable to be penetrated by the English and they tore it down to show that. But the name pays homage to the early stock markets that were created by the Dutch in the 1600s. Now, as I go here back to the first slide that we were looking at, all of the aforementioned relates directly to these Dutch still lifes and the phenomenal realism. Because as we look at this picture plane, what we see are paintings of tulips, peonies, even a few roses and other wildflowers. What makes this so compelling is that all of these flowers in nature, they actually cannot be in bloom at the same point in time. So in this picture plane, we're not looking at something that's realistic so much as something that's surreal because in nature, those flowers don't bloom together. But here the artist has created that. And what the artist was doing was creating a searing commentary on the society in which this painting was created. The artist's commentary was that what people were doing by getting incredibly rich off of trading the certificates and creating the world's first stock exchange was unnatural and it was against the will of their Protestant God. And in doing so and getting rich, what they were doing was against the way that they had been raised in a Protestant nation of Christianity. And if we go to here to the next slide, what we see once again is all of these beautiful flowers that do not bloom together, blooming together. And here at the bottom, I want to point out, I'm circling it here with the arrow. This is a picture of a butterfly. And a butterfly, what it shares with the flowers is not just its beautiful colors, but that both of them are incredibly ephemeral and have short lifespans. This was the artist's way of saying, if even if you get incredibly rich in 17th century Holland, you still have to die. So was it really worth the absurd human pursuit of earthly pleasures to go against the nature of, 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 of God? This was a question that was being asked by these paintings that seemed just quite normal to us, but it was a profound and searing commentary. And then in the bottom left, we see exotic shells from far off lands. These are an idea that speaks to the world's first ever attempts at globalization bringing exotic goods into the mainstream and selling them for a profit. To bring this all full circle, we see a painting that's a Dutch still life from the same time period, but it's very somber colors. It's almost a bit dreary and banal in its colors. And what we see is this feast that has these incredible delicacies on this table. But what I want to draw your attention to first is I'm circling with here with the arrow. This is a Venetian handmade glass goblet that's been shattered and fallen over. And it's at the very edge of the table. And this thing that it's balancing on, this plate, is about to fall over the edge. Just like so too is the bread roll, the olive, and the lemon. And then if we look at the rind of the lemon, the rind of the lemon is actually hanging over the edge of the table. This was all the artist's way of saying, of all the riches and all of these things we're bringing back from these far off lands, they're all on the edge of our existence and it's all about to come shattering down, just like this glass here, and creating a bubble that is going to burst eventually. This was the fear of that society and they actually had divinated the future quite correctly because it wasn't long before Dutch was knocked off this shelf of superpower by the English. And the one final thing I want to show you here is in the very far left of the picture plane, 
is a candle that's been extinguished. This was the idea of the artist saying, everyone's getting rich right now, but soon the flame is going to be extinguished and this will all be over. And we should take heed of that idea and the nature and the laws of our God. So these paintings were searing commentaries. I hope that going forward, you can look not just at still lifes, but art perhaps as a whole as having so much rich, deep meaning that is just behind the veil that we can see. And also that hopefully going forward, it enriches our thoughts both in class with our own still lifes and out of it. I hope you guys have enjoyed listening to this idea and all that I've shared as much as I've enjoyed sharing it with you. So thank you so much for listening.